All right, prior to the establishment of the Cretan state in 1898, Cretans had limited autonomy under the Ottoman Empire. And despite restrictions placed on their ability to manage archeological affairs, material objects continued to have a defining role in the island's cultural heritage. This paper considers how the Greek sea logos of Candia, also known as the local educational group, balanced its control of local antiquities while simultaneously securing relationships between scientific and academic institutions abroad. Aside from excavations, the Sologos promoted these relations through the advertisement and sales of casts from objects discovered on the island. And I argue that these advertisements were twofold in their purpose. First, these advertisements were part of a late 19th century movement to defray conservation expenses for recently excavated antiquities. And second, and more importantly, apart from sales and profits, these advertisements were used to garner transnational support for the scientific achievements of Cretan archaeology and the Sologos' supervision and their ability to maintain the island's antiquities on site with them. Using archival collections from the Archaeological Museum of Heraclio, this paper serves as a case study to uncover the circumstances surrounding the June 1, 1895 circular sent to foreign institutions by Dr. Yosef Hadzidakis, the president, and Professor Stefanos Santhuthides, who was the secretary, which advertised the sales of a cast from a 7th century BCE didelic statue in Poros Lithos discovered at Eleftherna. The second was the head of Aphrodite from Gortina, and the third was the Gortina legal code. And in this circular, the photographic image of the archaic statue from Eleftherna really does represent this newfound mobility, circulation, and distribution of replicas in Crete. But what is important about this document is actually not the document itself, but what the document represents about the relationship between Cretan excavators and European archaeologists during this period under the Ottoman Turkish administration, specifically with regard to the Italian archaeologist Federico Halber. Now, in order to make the claim that these circulars were meant to garner transnational support for the protection of Cretan antiquities under the Ottoman and Turkish administration, I divide this paper into two main sections. The first, I discuss the context and the importance of the Italian archaeologist on Crete, Federico Halber, who served, I argue, as an advisor and friend to the local Cretan educational group, the Sologos, who in turn was the author of the letters that we will be reading from the archives today. Second, I discuss the circular itself, which advertises the sale and solicitation of these casted replicas deemed to have archaeological importance. As Nathan Schlanger has proposed in his article, The Past is in the Present, the history of archaeology needs to go beyond a reductive field of scientific inquiry of archaeological discoveries. We must embrace, additionally, the lesser known triumphs, shortcomings, and also mishaps that may have been dismissed from our familiarity with known accounts. Therefore, in this paper, I utilize these archival documents that are mostly handwritten manuscripts within Kathi Rabusa, a 19th century compromise between ancient Greek and Demotic Greek. And in doing so, I discuss the involvement of foreign archaeologists who were involved in the local educational groups when the island was under Ottoman rule, this namely being Halber. Halber, who conducts the excavations at Gortina, the Idian Cave, and Sikros, is not the only foreign archaeologist who is operating in Crete under this time of occupation. But he is, I argue, in 1895, one of the most prominent ones that is working with the Cretan archaeologists and helping them further autonomy from the Ottomans that eventually was secured in 1898. Halber served as a mediator, I argue, between these peripheral supporters abroad and the Sologos' scientific agenda, which is a reflection of the connections and communication needed in order to become a productive archaeologist on the island of this time. Until Crete was entirely independent from Ottoman authority, I argue that it was within the Sologos' best interest to secure these allies among the great powers, who would not only assist them, and preserving their cultural heritage, but also advocate potentially for the political positions of certain Cretans 
through government petitions and media outreach. Partnering with the Sologos, Halber worked to secure the Gortina Wall and arranged for its removal to be placed within the Museum of Araclio, which was just developing at this time. And in Halber's letter to Yosef Hadzidakis on the 26th of April in 1895, Halber offered advice as to how he could assist the archaeological Sologos of the Crete and about their cause for autonomy, free from Ottoman control. And in writing such, it becomes in this same letter very clear that the archaeological images that were chosen for that advertisement really do extend beyond this physical mere representation of the cast to be sold. Therefore, the published images of the excavated objects were intended not only to defray conservation and preservation expenses for important Cretan antiquities, but more importantly, to serve as this symbolic capital for the Cretan cause. So if you'll indulge me for a moment, I would just like to read a long excerpt from this letter and explain later its importance. So quoting Halber, William J. Stillman told me that he wants me myself to do the article for the Times, but that it must be written very intensely to contain not words, but facts and some drawings and some requests. That is, that we should say that Crete needs to be explored because the Turkish government foolishly impedes progress and that once and for all, we must abandon the system of obstination and that of the management of the administration of antiquities must be given to the association, which was the Sologos. This is the way that the others want the articles, clear and open. I hesitate fearing that I may harm you instead of benefiting you especially now that I am reading in the newspapers of Crete that the good deputies, such as Fakianakis and others, who could undertake the defense of the draft of a law, do not want to remain candidates. I hope that the day after tomorrow, I shall find letters from Rome from you to guide me. I'm wanting to see if the article that I wrote for the Athenaeum will be published next Monday. Also, this one should be written very intense, but in a way that it should not irritate the Ottomans. But I will do something in some way. I will get the occasion from the saving of the great inscription. And if you think that it is possible for great things to happen in relation to all these at the meeting, and that it would be good to be ready for war in favor of our association, and in general of the archaeological matter, you can do the following. The most important slide. Compose three or four telegrams according to the circumstances that they will be presented. On each draft of each telegram, you should put the number. So for example, telegram one, two, three, etc., and enclose them for me in your first letter. Next, when the occasion arrives, that is when you think that it is time for the telegram to be sent to the times, just telegraph to me from Crete, one, two, three, four, etc. Then I will bring to Stillman the telegram one or two labeled, which would be prepared and then I will try to have it be sent immediately. Do you understand me? The government would not let you telegraph directly from Crete if it is about matters and drafts of laws or about matters that the government is trying to fight. This letter just read and now presented in its original form in Kafid Ravisa Greek is important because it connects the sales and the replicas of the Cretan archeological cause of independence from the Ottoman Turkish control of antiquities as well as the island's population. Certainly, communication was monitored incoming and outgoing from Crete via telegram, which is why Halber stresses his utmost discretion regarding the potential to send three to four different telegrams with directions for Halber's article about Crete that would be featured in newspapers circulated throughout Europe. Halber's advocacy for the scientific mission of the Sologos is evident in a later letter he wrote to Hatzidakis from Rome on the 18th of May in 1895, offering additional advice as to how the Sologos and the scientific achievements of Crete could be better recognized on a more transnational level through media and the cooperation of foreign institutions. The Sologos needed funding for the restoration and conservation of artifacts found, which is indisputable. But as such, they did have to solicit institutions and foreign schools to purchase cast of select torsos and inscriptions from recently excavated sites on Crete. And although these casts lacked high profit margin values for the Sologos, they offered intrinsic value for the group 
because as Halber understood in his letter to Hadzidakis, they preserved and served this representation of Cretan cultural heritage. And to quote Halber now, of course, the whole thing will not be profitable from the point of view of money, but for the association, your moral great for the union will be wonderful, unquote. So even as a replica, a column from the Law Code of Gortina could work in favor of the Sologos during this period of political change because it's a visual appeal functioned, not only as an educational piece, but also as a representation of Crete's important past. But why then is it so important that we look at these letters between Frederico Halber and Yosef Hadzidakis, the president, about caste from 1895? Well, it wasn't until June 18th in 1899 that an archeological law for the island was created and voted upon under the newly created Cretan state which then only organized for an official public archaeological service in which Yosef Hadzidakis would serve as the Ephor of Antiquities in Heraclio, as well as being associated as the director of the museum, while Stefano Santhuthides served as the Ephor of Antiquities in Hanya. So with this in mind, we can understand why Hadzidakis' letters are so important four years later. He was a physician in his own right, a medical doctor in gynecology, but he also excavated, which was needed to further advance the island's material culture and its protection, keeping it in mind before any law was actually voted upon. So as the president of this educational group and taking on many challenges, Hadzidakis made one of its main objectives in 1884 to safeguard, collect, and display the island's antiquities. And one way to secure that mission he saw was through foreign partnerships. Crete, with a varying tradition of resistance and occupation, was lawfully separate from Greece when the Cretan archaeological mission began. And by this time, foreign institutions were established in Athens while working with the Greek government. And as you can see from the letter and the circulars of archaeological replicas, Cretan archaeology did evolve then from these concerted efforts of not just what we consider typical archaeologists, but from Cretan politicians, doctors, linguists, lawyers, educators, and cultural heritage enthusiasts. Foreign archaeological institutes, again, did not exist on the island at this point. Therefore, Greek laws did not actually apply, while Crete was semi-autonomous from 1878 to 1898 under the Ottoman Turkish administration. The first archaeological mission on Crete was not even established until 1899 with Halber, which is the year after Italy became one of the four great powers overseeing Crete once the Ottoman Turkish administration had been eliminated from the island. So if there's one main important takeaway from this paper, it's that the beginning of Cretan archeology span was part of this symbiotic relationship where Cretans relied on the resources, funding, and support of their international colleagues. Cretan archaeology began in 1878, 1879 with Minos Kalikorinos' first excavation at Kefala Hill, Knossos. But it was Yosef Hadzidakis, a trained medical physician, who legitimized this field of inquiry through his status as the local Sologos president with the help of his secretary, Stephanos Santhuthides. So what it may appear really on surface to be simply this advertisement for the sale of replicas for museums it has, more importantly, a hidden narrative about these secret communications, i.e. the telegrams, and the struggle for Cretan independence that was accessed from communications and archival documents. Thank you.